That would be great. Okay, well, again, thank you everybody for joining us. I apologize for the background noise. This is the closest I could get to a quiet space for a meeting. And so again, my apologies. So I wanted to start with an icebreaker question for Sheila and, and I guess Renee, since she's on the call too, if that's okay. Um, it's this question that we get asked a lot and it's a very simple question. So I think what we're trying to, to perfect is a very simple way of answering this question. And so um, the question is, what does environmental justice mean to you? Um, typically, we spend a lot of time answering that question, but I just wanted to ask everybody that question and just think about it in as short as an answer as you can. And for my answer to that question is, you know, protecting basic human rights and having a say in quality of life, in your quality of life. So Sheila, if you're there, you want to take a stab at that one? It's a big question. So in 1991 or 1992, um, this group that was led by Mustafa Ali, who was the founder of the, the first environmental justice unit at the EPA, they, they went through, I don't know, there were like, I don't know, 10 or so recommendations. And I really like those. Um, I can't really, if I were to summarize them now on the fly, um, it, it has to do with, and it speaks to what you were saying, Uni, just um, um, valuing the entire ecosystem, you know, is, is sort of how I see environmental, that's, that would be my elevator pitch. No, I think I think that's great when you think about the ecosystem. You know, a lot of people just think about it as an environment, air, water, soil. But I think the way you look at it is a much broader picture of everything else that 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 we interact with in a day to day, our life day to day. I appreciate it. How about um, Renee? Are you back from getting your? Is it your tea or your coffee? I can't remember. Yes, um, honestly, for indigenous communities that I come from, it's protecting our way of life from our own self-determination, from environmental racism, our sources of life, because we never looked at them as resources. They were always sources of life for future generations and our connection to the biosphere from our own self-determination because we were resigned to reservations, often not even our original homelands. And what did that play into lack of ability to protect the land and rights of nature as we look at it as a living organism. And then recognizing how we've been as a status quo erased even from socioeconomics and many other spaces to no longer have even an influence of how to protect them with more of a cultural context. Thank you, Renee. Um, I, hope you, I hope you write that down because that's, that's very profound, you know, and I think a lot of people you know, need to hear it that way. So I'd appreciate if you wrote it for me, I would love to share that internally within my organization as well. Sure, I can try to put it in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, has Beatrice joined us yet? I don't see her there. So, I mean, I'm just going to get started um, and start, talk a little bit about our last meeting. And for those folks that just joined, I apologize, I'm sitting outside. So I'll go from looking really bright to somebody in witness protection program. And I apologize for that. Um, it's the way I guess the light is changing outside here. So our last meeting, um, first of all, welcome to our little commit subcommittee. We are very, very small. There's three of us on the subcommittee, which means um, we do a lot of work. Um, some of the things we talk about may be um, very technical. But overall, our objectives are included at the bottom of the, the, um, the agenda that was shared. And um, last week, what we did was we reviewed the recurring questions that came up from you know, the overall document that CDPH is putting together. And I saw four different buckets that this information fell into. 
The first bucket had to do with data for cumulative impacts. Um, the, the role, the second one was the role for um, community science. And then the third one was thinking about the social determinants of health and making sure that we have them adequately captured. And then the fourth one that um, Rene raised was, you know, the role of community narratives or individual na narratives in, um, in the regulatory process. So regarding um, cumulative impacts, I think we had a really good discussion and we understood that cumulative impact is a barrier. And one of the problems is the sand isn't quite there yet to um, incorporate it into regulatory decisions. And I think waiting on the science um, does a disservice to the communities. And so thinking about how or how we can use the data to the data that we have right now um, as a way to inform some of the regulatory decisions that need to be made before the science gets caught up with us. And we had a suggestion for using a tiered approach which means, you know, incorporating screening levels and then, you know, um, and then the second tier would be, you know, revisiting the data with the more stringent approach and um, incorporating it into some kind of regulatory decision. And um, the second conversation we had was around community science. And um, I think Renee, I think it was Renee who brought it up, I'm not sure, but communities are just tired of submitting the same comments over and over and over again. And so we have to be cognizant about that as we start talking about or providing recommendations around how we use the communities in the scientific process. Um, so we talked about leveraging existing programs to address community concerns. And that was um, the, the, the state's um, oil and gas reporting program and leveraging a program like that for communities to, you know, share some of their um, grievances and making sure that, you know, the process is transparent and the grievances are addressed in a, you know, in a, in a, in a good, in a quick manner so that, you know, you're not having to go over and over and attend all the different um, hearings. And on the issue of community-based research, um, the idea that the data can't really influence um, decisions, but um, can be used to find resources, can be used to um, target resources, um, can be used to target research. And so there's this whole other conversation that we need to, to talk about um, around community-based research or community-driven research. And then we also had a really informative discussion with Michael Ogletree, and he is, I believe, a director at the Air Pollution um, Division, Air Pollution Control Division, and that they're working really hard to address some of these challenges with um, number one, collecting the data, and number two, how to better communicate the data to um, the relevant agencies or the community that needs the data. So was there anything that I missed from our discussion last time that I should have brought up, Renee or Sheila or Labna? Oh, that was good. Yeah, I think that was a good summary. Um, and um, yeah, I, I think that was great. And maybe we can um, just like ground ourselves a little bit in like kind of where we're going now um, just for the for this meeting. Um, and I, I did drop a link to the agenda in the chat. Um, that was the, yeah, that was the first link that I dropped in the chat. So um, you need, feel free to, feel free to review that if that's helpful. Okay, I'm gonna get to the chat here. So oh, today's agenda. Okay, so sorry, give me a second here. So I think for today, um, continuing in on that, um, how we use community data. We are so fortunate to have Katie Dickinson from Colorado School of Public Health to discuss you know, some of their challenges in, in, in their project from the Gratitude Project where they um, specifically had some data accessibility issues and other issues. Um, and then also recognizing that Sheila has to drop off at noon. So we're gonna really try and pack as much as we can during um, this, this remaining 45 minutes of this discussion. Um, after that presentation, hopefully we can have a really robust conversation about potential um, you know, recommendations that we can make. And if we do have a quorum, we'll continue after a short break. 
and then roll up our sleeves and continue our review of the recommendations. Um, like I said, if time allows. And I did update, you know, some of my thoughts in a document that's that um, we're developing around um, community science, you know, community-driven science and, and how it can be used and, and other things like that. And so um, are we ready to jump into Kate's presentation and Kate's section of this meeting? Yeah, I think so. And I, uh, just FYI, I just heard from Beatrice that she'll be joining in a few minutes. Um, she's just running a little late. Um, so hopefully Great. we will have Great. quorum and then we can continue, uh, we can continue on. Um, and so as Uni mentioned, um, you know, we, we invited Katie here to kind of share lessons learned um, from the Gratitude Project. And, and maybe Katie, you can kind of get us grounded in the project and um, provide a little background there as well. Um, and uh, as Uni mentioned, after we, after we break and come back, um, and if you all click in the agenda, you'll see um, some hyperlinks. Um, the first hyperlink in the agenda is to, um, and I'll actually just do a very, very quick uh, screen share. Um, but if you click on this link here for the recommendations, um, this is, these are the recommendations that have been pulled out of the full task force um, kind of draft one report that apply specifically to this data subcommittee. Um, and so if you click on those, um, it'll take you to a PDF. And these recommendations are listed along with some reoccurring questions that we've been asking. Um, so you'll see, you know, potential recommendations listed um, and then uh, these reoccurring and outstanding questions. Uh, for the purposes of today, we are gonna focus on the recommendations in particular. And what we've done is simply um, added the, the recommendations uh, to a Jamboard slide and we'll kind of take some time to uh, talk about these recommendations in detail and see um, if you know folks have opinions about whether they want the recommendation to be changed or more specified or you know provide alternative options to the existing recommendations. This is all in preparation for um, the full task force meeting that is taking place next Tuesday, June 21st. Um, and so I just wanted to get us grounded in kind of the what we're gonna be doing over the next about hour and 45 minutes here. Um, and so we'll get into that um, more kind of interactive session a little bit later. But for now, um, yeah, Katie, we would love to hear from you. Yeah, before Katie starts, I just saw your your message, Lavna. I had that small chat window closed. I think it would be great, like you're right, to see who else is on the call. Um, we we can do that for the next couple of minutes if that's okay with you guys okay um i tend to do this using the alphabetic order so um if your name starts with an a and then kind of let's work our way through it so you've already met the the committee members and you've met labner so everybody else if you don't mind just taking a minute to um introduce yourself and say why you're interested in this subcommittee and if you don't want to if you don't have a comment you know that's fine too just say your name and who you're with and then just and then we can move on so i think we'll start with um araceli hi um i'm araceli um lara i'm working at the blm office here in colorado and i just i just saw the newsletter so i wanted to join and see what's going on here because I'm not from Colorado, so I'm from New Mexico, so yeah. And if we're going in alphabetical order, I think maybe Melissa will be next. Hi, I'm Melissa Islamati, and I work for Lockheed Martin Space, and I live here in Colorado. Welcome, Melissa. And uh, maybe Tara. Hello, I'm Tara Webster. I'm um, with the CDPHE in the Toxicology and Environmental Epidemiology Office. And I'm also um, very much a part of the oil and gas health information and response program in our complaint line. So when I saw that, um, I'm just uh, here to listen and Yeah. 
Thanks, Tara. And then um, Valerie? Valerie, if you're speaking, we um, can't hear you. It's, I think I could hear something very faint, but. Um, Hi, all. Sorry, I'm Valerie. I'm with Earth Justice, and I'm just here to view today. I think, is that all, Lebna? Yeah, I think so. And I'm um, glad to see some new um, new folks on the call. And uh, just so for folks that are joining for the first time and, and to kind of like get you grounded in the work, um, you know, this this task force has is, is 22 members and is split up into five different subcommittees. This is one of those subcommittees um, focused on data and, um, and uh, reducing environmental health disparities. Um, and we are about, we're about six months, um, seven months into the process and um, are working towards a final uh, report of recommendations um, that will be submitted to the governor and legislature in November. Um, so especially for the latter half of the meeting, those recommendations that we'll be reviewing and kind of getting input on, um, those are like a very draft, the draft level recommendations that we'll continue to discuss over the next few months um, before we get to that final report. Um, so hope that helps in terms of context. Um, Yuni, I'll, I'll turn it back over to you. Yeah, thank you. And so just for those folks that are new, our objectives are, are, are you know, are in the agenda. Um, so our goal is to, we're going to try and address the lack of data and data sharing between the state um, agencies. And we hope to make rec recommendations how to also improve the research and data collection. And then the third final task that we'll start on our next call, finally, is, um, you know, making recommendations for establishing me measurable goals um, to eliminate the health disparities related to um, the disproportionality of impacted communities. So I know Kate's probably been waiting patiently. So Kate, I'm gonna hand it over to you to go ahead and get started with um, your presentation. Great, thank you. Um, hi everyone, I'm Katie Dickinson. I am an assistant professor at the Colorado School of Public Health. Um, and um, yeah, I actually don't have a, like a, I don't have any PowerPoint slides, which is very strange as an academic to show up to something without lots and lots of PowerPoint. But um, what I do just wanna share is uh, a little bit of the background um, on this report that uh, is linked in the, um, in the agenda, but I'll drop it here in the chat as well, uh, that we put together uh, in partnership with um, Green Latinos. And so I'll tell you a little bit about just the background of where this sort of the origin of this report came from, and then I'll give just a few of the um, key findings and recommendations um, from, from this report and try to link those um, back to the, uh, the tasks of this, this subcommittee. So. Um, my um, uh, team at the Colorado School of Public Health uh, started a project um, about a year and a half ago uh, that we called the Gratitude Project. We're actually shifting to calling it the Reciprocity Project because we think that represents a little bit better what we are trying to achieve, which is reframing the way that we think about environmental justice and talk about environmental justice um, from focusing primar primarily on the damages and harms in certain communities to thinking about the relationships between communities and how those um, uphold um, and could potentially, um, uh, you know, if, if we repaired relationships um, across communities, um, how could we address environmental justice um, through, through that lens? So really trying to think about, you know, what are the, if we think about communities that are disproportionately impacted, you know, in order for that, to, to exist, there have to be communities that are sort of disproportionately not impacted, right, that are pushing their harms and damages onto other communities. And so thinking about how to build more uh, reciprocal um, and, and healthy relationships across communities. So um, as part of that, we partnered with, um, with Ian Tafoya and Green Latinos um, to look at North Denver communities um, and uh, sort of focus to, to, to build a report 
or, or actually to, to build a, a set of communication tools that would talk about um, you know, the environmental justice challenges in North Denver and how those are related to and really thinking about like how we could communicate those to other communities in the region that are connected, interconnected with North Denver um, and, and maybe don't understand those connections, maybe haven't um, thought of themselves, right? So if you think about a community like, you know, Central Park community or, you know, Cherry Creek, um, these communities might not feel like they are, you know, they don't have an environmental justice problem because if you pull up something like, you know, an EJ screen um, and, you know, map, um, you know, a, an address in Cherry Creek, it might show up as like gray, like, oh, okay, there is an environmental justice problem here. Um, and so what we wanted to do is, is um, to, um, to take a lens to environmental justice that focuses on the goods and services and um, and uh, infrastructure that a community like North Denver provides, what is the impact on that community? Um, and how do other communities that benefit from those, from those goods and services and infrastructure, you know, what, um, what obligation do they have or what, what connection do they have um, to that, um, to North Denver and to, you know, again, what obligation to um, engaging in and supporting the efforts that folks in North Denver um, are, um, are leading to address those harms. So that's kind of the origin of the project. And then, so what we did was we started researching. We, we basically, you know, said, okay, to start this project, we need to understand what all of the, um, you know, what these goods and services and industries and impacts are in North Denver. And so we sort of um, broke this out. Uh, and, and in the report, we break this down across multiple different sectors. So we look at land use. We look at power generation and transportation energy production. We look at um, goods production. Uh, we look at roads and rail, and we look at waste management. Um, that's probably not comprehensive, but it felt like a pretty good set of buckets for capturing a lot of the um, activities that, um, that are occurring um, in North Denver. And so in each of those categories, again, what we kind of wanted to know is like, what's the, like, you know, in terms of land use, how is the land being used in North Denver and what's the history, right? What's the, what, um, how do those land use patterns, um, how did those, those land use patterns um, come about? Um, and, and in that section also, we look at sort of for all of the different facilities that are in the area, um, what are the documented EPA violations? Um, and so we have um, a summary in the report, one of the, the key findings in that section is that there are 183 facilities in this North Denver, Denver region that have at least one um, documented violation of, um, of an EPA, um, uh, of the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, um, the uh, RICRA um, Resource Conservation Recovery Act, or the Safe Drinking Water Act. Um, most of those violations are Clean Water Act violations. Um, we were a little bit surprised that there aren't more Clean Air Act violations documented, but we think part of that is because of the way that um, that these violations are are documented, which comes uh, largely from self-reported data and um, and some inspections, but those are fairly infrequent. Um, so so in terms of land use, um, again, that was sort of one of our key findings, just in terms of the sort of the full scape uh, uh, scope. We also found that there are between 2,000 and 8,000 businesses operating in this North Denver region, um, which was, that's a really large range. And part of that is because, um, again, the, the data sources um, that we were looking at, there were sort of 8,000, um, uh, I think these were from like the chambers of commerce and, and various sources. And so depending on which source we looked at and whether it was sort of confirmed businesses or, you know, um, or unconfirmed um, that, that gave us a pretty large range. Um, in terms of power generation and transportation energy production, um, you know, we found that North Denver is home to a lot of uh, high profile energy facilities, including the Cherokee Generating Station and Suncor, um, but that there are other, you know, smaller facilities like the Metro Wastewater Reclamation District's power generation facility, Phillips 66 and Sinclair. Um, and then um, again, goods production, a lot of good production facilities, um, uh, large brands like PepsiCo, Cisco, Safeway, and Amazon Fresh, and then lots of smaller facilities. 
Um, the Nestle Purina Pet Factory, right, has a source, um, has been a documented source of obnoxious odors um, that's been out of compliance with the Clean Water Act for the past three years. Um, roads and rail, uh, you know, again, we're thinking, and I could, I could um, put up, um, in a second, I'll put up the, um, just um, here, I'll, just, oh, I can't share my screen. Um, there's a, a map, if you're in the report, if you scroll down to page four, there's a, a map that kind of shows the area that we included, um, that we're sort of defining as North Denver, it includes North Denver and Commerce City areas. Um, and so, you know, in that area, there's, um, you know, major highways, I-25, I-70, um, 270, and then uh, major rail lines, um, major uh, intermodal exchanges on the rail lines are also a significant source of, of pollution. Um, one of our um, most striking um, findings, I, I guess I'll come, come back to, to this in a second, um, in terms of data access, because I think that's one of the, the really key things that we found. So let me just go finally to waste management, 10 um, solid waste and recycling facilities um, in the North Denver and Commerce City area, as well as the Metro Wastewater um, uh, Robert Height treatment facility. So all of these, you know, facilities that are in this area, all this infrastructure, um, you know, the majority of the people that are benefiting from this don't live in North Denver. They're distributed across the region. So that's definitely one thing that we find, found that was, you know, again, kind of back to our original purpose of sort of showing how, um, how these, um, an area like North Denver um, sort of has these large distributed benefits but right at what cost? So, so the costs are, are really largely borne. Um, uh, many of the costs are borne by those those um, people who live in this area. We estimate that about um, about fifty thousand people are living in the area that we um, that we uh, designated here. And you know the the land use, the zoning has really prioritized the needs of, of industry and business over the the needs for you know say. Um, parks and green space and facilities serving the, the population that, that lives there. Um, what I just want to emphasize in terms of you know, our key findings, so again, there's sort of lots of specific findings about the specific facilities. I think for, for this group, um, in terms of data access, it was very hard for us to answer. And we were you know, a group of um, you know, uh, PhDs and uh, master's students trying to ask what seemed like pretty simple questions, like how many businesses are in this area, or um, for the, the rail lines, you know, how many trains travel through North Denver um, every month, every year, um, and what are those trains carrying? Um, you know, what are the, the um, uh, you know, total emissions from different, different facilities? Um, at each of those turns, it was very difficult for us to get specific answers. Um, and, uh, and a lot of that has to do with, um, with proprietary data. So for example, on the rail lines, this is again one of the things that was most surprising to us that um, by federal law, rail lines um, or railroad companies um, are not, um, uh, their, their, passing, their, uh, their freight rail data is proprietary and they don't have to share that. I think there's some, you know, annual reporting at the state level that has to happen. But in terms, again, of asking a question about, you know, how many trains and what are they carrying through this particular area, um, they're like the government signs non-disclosure agreements with the rail lines. Um, and so you know, even the government um, doesn't have access to those data. Um, so I think that, uh, um, and then, you know, if we want to go beyond sort of into also specific questions about so what are the you know what are the environmental impacts and what are the health impacts of of those um, specific activities we definitely found a lack of research and data um, answering those those types of questions you know how many um, cancer cases are specifically attributable to um, you know to the facilities in this area to the transportation um, you know the traffic that's, that's going through these area this area. Um, you know, there, there, there aren't well, um, uh, you know, cohort studies that could, could um, track those, those, that information over time. Um, at the same time, we definitely through, you know, focus groups and, um, and uh, other activities that we um, conducted going through this, we know 
right, that, um, that the community is feeling these impacts. And, um, and so I would say two, two key recommendations and then I'll, I'll um, wrap up. One is that when we're thinking about data, um, you know, access to data to support uh, environmental justice action. Um, in addition to thinking about what new types of data collection do we need? Um, how can we do more research? How can we collect more data? I think that um, addressing the structurally um, uh, defined barriers to accessing existing data that companies have, that, that industry has, that regulators have, um, and making those data available to the public and to researchers um, and to regulate and you know to, to society more generally. Um, I, I think examining those laws that actually prohibit, right, that, that, that are specific barriers that say the public does not have the ability to know you know what's being what chemicals are being used by this facility or what trains are going through here um, those policy barriers to data access um, i think should be highly prioritized in thinking about um, how, how we move forward and, and give communities access to the information that they have a right to to have um, that would be one thing the second and i think you actually already hit on this is that you know, even that, that we, we shouldn't let lack of data be a barrier to action. Um, so I think that, you know, even though, like I said, we don't, you know, there is not a health study that can, that, that currently exists um, that can tell us, you know, exactly how many cases of particular health conditions are attributable to um, facilities in this area. We know and we document in this, in this, um, in this report that, you know, uh, 175,000 vehicles drive past Swansea Elementary on I-70 uh, every day, and many of those are, you know, diesel trucks. And there are, you know, even if there's not a specific health study for this area, we know that diesel air pollution has uh, very high, um, you know, health impacts, um, specifically for children. So, you know, addressing those impacts, um, you know, even if we can't specifically quantify them for this particular community, we know more than enough to justify taking action to, to protect communities from, you know, the, the uh, what, we, what we can say with high confidence is a very high environmental health burden um, from the, and, and cumul 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 cumulatively, right? So it's not, um, there's not just one thing, but, but again, that's the other message from this report is that um, there's, right, it's not just sort of one source. We, we think a lot, we talk a lot about Suncor, and that's important and, you know, clearly, um, you know, uh, yeah, that not, not to discount the impact that Suncor has, but um, I think, again, one of the other messages is that, you know, Suncor is really only one of many um, players in, in a community like, like North Denver that's having, um, um, impacts on, on the community. So um, yeah, I'm happy to answer more questions. I will also drop in here um, this uh, story map that my students made that focus, focuses specifically on the uh, waste management um, sector. And um, again, I think one of the, it's, it's a really nicely done sort of illustration um, of the, this question of, you know, who's, who's benefiting um, and also, you know, one of the, the key things, um, uh, you know, apologies to my students because this seemed like a good idea and then they ran into the similar sorts of barriers to, you know, even um, being able to generate or to define data on, for example, you know, how many, um, uh, how much waste is coming from what, from this neighborhood to that neighborhood. Um, again, there are, you know, private uh, waste hauling companies that, that don't have to share that data. Um, so, so yeah, that's um, where I'll uh, wrap up, but I'm happy to, to answer some questions and um, um, yeah, and also just uh, shout out to my really wonderful group of students that spent a lot of time digging around and finding all this information. Thank you so much, Katie. Um, and I just want to point out that, you know, while Katie has shared all of this for the purposes of this data subcommittee. Obviously, there's a ton of overlap with the, with the other subcommittee that's um, 
co-chaired by Beatrice and Renee, who are both on this call. So I'm very happy that you both are here to kind of like hear about all this and have access to the reports um, to review. Um, you know, this is this is going to relate and and kind of spur ideas for recommendations that come out of the um, environmental equity and cumulative impacts analysis subcommittee as well. Um, and just so folks know, um, the report that Katie originally linked us to, um, which which brought her here as a guest speaker, um, will be included in the board packet um, that we will be sending out on the 16th for people to review. So um, thanks, Katie. And um, I, I'll open it up for our task force members to ask any questions. I am really, really grateful. Thank you, Katie. I, I kind of want to address um, specifically the policy barriers. My biggest thing is making sure that we have protective spaces to not return to the status quo, because the status quo is what creates the marginalization often. So being able to share any info with that, that's awesome that you're especially use, uh, working with youth earlier on about what that looks like too, because they'll be voters. So really knowing what that'll be eventually. So I'm really, really grateful in any work that we can expand with policy barriers specifically. I'm, I would love to expand on. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, again, that was something that we, um, you know, ran up against at a few points in their report. Um, and that's kind of where I would like to uh, go next, where we're thinking about, you know, writing this up as a, we, we reduce it as a, produce it as a report, you know, for the public, but um, thinking about writing up a, a paper for an academic journal. And I think that that looking at those, those policy barriers might be where we focus for, for that. And obviously we'd share that publicly as well, but I think it's really, um, yeah, important just to, to say that, you know, again, we, we measure, we, we know a lot about the things that we have said that we care about as a society, and we produce a lot of data on, on those things. Um, and so I think where we find lack of data um, is also a reflection of sort of what we've, what we've decided to prioritize. And so again, you know, this, this message that it's not the, that, you know, in a lot of these cases, you know, the, the questions that we were asking are things that should absolutely be knowable. It's not, it's not a mystery. I mean, it's not, you know, again, a question about how many trains, like somebody knows that. And so the fact that the public doesn't have access to that is, is a policy choice that we've made to say that the privacy or the, the you know, the security rights that the, um, that the railroad companies are asserting are being prioritized over the community's right to have that information. Katie, this, thank you for this, um, sharing this, all this information. I saw this report a little while back and it's, it's very impressive. I had a couple of questions. Um, how long did it take you all to really put this together and like the, the human power that is needed? Because we've heard from these multiple agencies that it's really hard for them to talk to each other and understand and it's too big. And it, so I'm kind of curious about that. And then do you have any specific recommendations um, in terms of going through this process of how agencies can start to look at this process um, to communicate better with each other when making permitting decisions mm -hmm. um, specifically for these communities? And what we found is that these diverse agencies that have different um, pollution points don't speak to each other or they yeah. don't look at historic land use um, <laughs> and don't ask some of these bigger pe pictures. So I guess what would be your like tangible, like this is where I would start or let's make sure we don't miss this or this yeah. is imperative to achieving this um, outcome um, for us to set as recommendations for, for the agencies, for our state agencies. Yeah, really great questions. Um, so the easier one to answer is it took my team of um, uh, three, well, actually at, at various different times, we had up to five um, students uh, working on this um, and it took us about nine months to, to put this report together. Um, and, you know, uh, I think, again, a lot of it was 
Um, I, I think what I'm hopeful that, you know, th this focuses on one specific community and what we try to do in the report um, as well as to, to have, you know, clear method sections so that if we did want to do this for Pueblo, um, and th then we could say, okay, so for land use, uh, we looked at, you know, these agencies to find the zoning laws and searched, you know, chambers of commerce, right? So, so we tried to sort of make the methodology um, um, transparent within the report so that it can be replicated, but we did feel like we kind of had to like, make that right, like that was a that was a, a significant time investment at the beginning was saying, okay, what's the scope of things that we wanna focus on and where do we go for information on all of these different things? And then, like I said, in some cases, we just hit like completely brick walls, like could not find anything on trains. And, you know, my student Stephanie had to like make a bunch of phone calls and have like off the record conversations with people. Um, to get even sort of the very thin information that we end up having here. So it is certainly a time investment. Um, and I think the, um, so, so, but I think that there, you know, ways that this could be made easier are, you know, developing um, protocols, like having a resource that has links to the, um, there, there's really fantastic, I, and it's linked in here, this, um, uh, EPA ECHO database is, uh, you know, something that's a pretty easy go-to for finding the information on EPA violations. Um, I'll also put a plug in for the, um, I can, I'll share this information as well, but the Environmental Data Justice, no, Environmental Data Governance Initiative, EDGI, um, has been building a lot of tools that um, will scrape government websites and allow you to map the locations of facilities that have violations and to do that by watershed for the Clean Water Act, for example. So we're actually in the process of sort of building out some companion maps that would go with this report to help help look at some of, of those things. So, I mean, again, it's not, um, I wouldn't let people tell you that like, this is insurmountable. Again, like we put resources towards the things that we care about and um, with, you know, some, you know, not incredibly, you know, fairly green students doing this, um, we were able to, to build a pretty comprehensive report in about nine months. Um, in terms of, you know, recommendations for, for data sharing across agencies and um, what we take from that, I don't have a great answer for that because I haven't, you know, again, we're, we're I, I think what I'm really looking for now are the examples of places that are doing that well um, and that have overcome some of these hurdles. Um, one thing that I think I may have brought up in a, a prior call, but NEPA's um, um, uh, a need, like a, the NEPA analysis cumulative impacts, um, the, the way that cumulative impacts are being considered or could can be considered within a NEPA analysis. Um, I'll try to find some resources on that. I might've tried to show those before, um, but I, I was at a um, environmental justice workshop in March um, and heard a presentation on that. I think, so that, that piece that I think you touched on that, um, and, and again, was a really key finding here is that if we're only looking at, you know, if we only had looked at air quality violations, we actually wouldn't have found very much here, um, which I think, again, is, is more an artifact of the way that that those violations are, uh, you know, data is gathered and reported, then, you know, I, I don't think we would ever look at North Denver and say like, oh, yeah, cool, there's no air quality issues there. Um, but, um, but I think when you look at this all together and say, okay, so, you know, we've got air quality, we've got water quality, we've got Drinking Water Act, and we want to be able to look at all of those together in order to be able to understand how the community is impacted and how to, um, how to move forward. Um, so, so yes, I mean, I think, um, thanks for sharing that, uh, Lugna. I, yeah, I think, I think any models for gathering data that looks at cumulative impacts across different sources of exposure um, 
and you know considers that and how we how we regulate and permit it. Um, I think is really important. Are there any other questions for Katie? Um, I think this this issue of um, the data barrier that that you know um, set up through policy or safety or other um, like barriers, I think is very intriguing or interesting to try and figure out um, a middle ground. And I think one of the things we had talked about in this subcommittee was inviting somebody from the rails to give us an idea of, you know, you know, what are their challenges with sharing this data? And is there a way that um, it can be shared? Can it be put in a place where with a trusted agency or somebody that can provide um, some kind of, I guess, boundary around the information? Not necessarily the exact pinpoint um, information, but give some kind of idea of what information is. You know, um, just similarly, like when a truck goes by, they do have um, some of those GHS markings on the side of them, so you get an idea of what's in that truck. You know, is that enough information for you to develop um, as a part of your program or as a part of the projects you're looking at? If you knew that the, 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 that the the cargo was hazardous or it was not hazardous or it was flammable, it was not flammable. I mean, just some kind of um, something in the middle that would be enough for you to, to you know to to make a decision or to make your to formulate your research. I mean, it won't be quantitative information that you would get, but it would be maybe enough qualitative information for you to incorporate into some kind of um, prioritization of research or decision, just a thought. Yeah, I mean, I think um, the security concerns um, around rail uh, that, that, you know, so, so the justification for this information not being available is that, you know, if we had, if we, if um, bad guys know exactly where a train is at a given time and what's on it, then, you know, they can, you know, that, Kind of creates opportunities or for for terrorist attacks or um, things along uh, along those those lines. Um, I think that, um, like you're saying, I think you know we can we can look at how to address those security concerns while still like it, again like knowing over the past month how many trains came through this area and you know what categories of um, of freight were they carrying? Um, it seems like there's probably a way to, to you know, honor those security concerns. And, and actually one of the things we found is that like, there's actually more information about, um, that's available about, it, about planes than about trains. And, you know, we know that planes have similar types of security concerns. So, so yeah, I think just, just looking at those and, and really kind of having the conversation about how to balance, right? Again, the community's right to have information about risks that it's exposed to with, with industry's concerns. And I think in a lot of cases, it's just, you know, those conversations haven't, haven't happened or haven't happened in a way that, that includes representation of community that's um, honored in the same way that the industry concerns have been. Thank you. I was just looking at EPCRA, just wondering if um, what, what's under EPCRA, if it's something that can be translated and used here. So I'm sorry, I was just kind of distracted there for a second. Because if you don't know, EPCRA is the Emergency Planning and Community Right to Act No, um, Right to Act, Right to No Act. And I think this is mostly around like stationary facilities that um, communities have the, the right to know you know, what's being developed or produced in a facility near them. So I'm not sure, no, I was just thinking out loud, so I apologize, but it's just something to think about. So I would really like to continue this conversation, you know, 
to see if we can we can find some kind of middle ground to move this along. Anybody else with questions or feedback here? I guess Katie, you did an excellent job. You know, everybody's like satisfied with what you had to say, or either they're they're churning it through in their mind, trying to think of other things that they would like to bring up. So if you can't think of anything right now during the course of the meeting, feel free to write it in the in the chat and we'll capture it and maybe we'll have Katie back at at some later date to continue this discussion. Yeah, I'm putting my I have one question. Oh, go ahead. I'm just saying I'm putting my email in the chat too. I have just one question. I mean, this seems like um, a great project to include even undergrads or high school students. Um, I'm hoping it will continue and including them because yeah, this absolutely. is the way to develop that consciousness. Yep, so I have one undergrad um, who is working with us. This, um, actually, she'll be working with us uh, with, over the next year out of a great program that my, um, some colleagues in my department run that, that brings undergrad students in for research experiences. So, so she's, she's actually really excited to be building some of the spatial um, tools that I was mentioning to kind of visually show, and this gets to your point too, Beatrice, um, you know, some, some nice story maps and visual tools that can, can communicate this dense material in, in different ways. Um, uh, so, so yeah, Ruth McConan um, is a CU Denver undergrad, um, and then um, we had a high school intern last summer um, who was from my community here in Louisville. And so, again, you know, I, my goal continues to be to try and build partnerships across communities and have, um, you know, getting communities that that are less um, impacted also um, involved and and um, you know working in partnership with. Um, so I love to have like a program that had students from Louisville and students from Commerce City working together to look at these issues and talk about how, you know, what's the role of each of our communities in, um, in solving these problems. Great. Um, if there are no other questions, then I would, uh, say that we take a five minute break. And then um, do we still have a quorum here, Labna? Let me see who's on here. Okay, then we can continue on with a conversation about the recommendations. And if you can stay on Kate, it would be great. You know, we would, we would appreciate input from you as well as we work through those recommendations. Is that okay, Labna? Yeah, that sounds great. Um, and I, I know Sheila, um, you might have to drop off. Um, but yeah, we will come back and we will jump right into the Jamboard. All right, thank Thanks, you. Katie.
Are we at about five minutes? Okay. Uh, is Beatrice back? I don't know, are the members back? Is Beatrice back online? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So am I gonna hand it over to you, Labna, to talk about the Jamboard? Sure, yes, happy to. Um, Okay, great. So um, I see our group size has shrank a little bit, but I'm really happy that um, Uni, Beatrice, um, Renee, all of our task force members are on. And of course, Katie, thanks for sticking around to kind of work through some of these recommendations. Um, I will just mention um, this is, you know, this meeting is, is a, about a week right before our full task force meeting taking place on June 21st. Um, that task force meeting is gonna be our first in-person meeting. Um, it's taking place in Commerce City at the Eagle Point Recreation Center. Um, that information can be found online on our website. Um, and so uh, it's a public meeting. So you know, folks, members of the public that are on this call that would like to attend that meeting, um, please feel free to do so. Um, the public comment period will take place between 5.30 and 6.30 PM. Um, so if folks wanna just kind of show up at the end of the meeting to interact with task force members in person and provide their input that way, um, that is welcome as well. Um, as you all saw in the meeting agenda there, and I'll drop that in the, in the chat um, once again, um, there is a hyperlink to the draft recommendations. Um, the recommendations uh, were pulled directly from the, the larger report. So you might see some kind of uh, color coding and stuff in there that might not make sense. I realize that the key um, is not listed at the top. It's actually in the full report, which was not pulled over. Um, but essentially anything that you see color coded is something that overlaps with another subcommittee's recommendations. Um, for the purposes of today, we are just gonna focus on providing via, feedback via the Jamboard. Um, and I will go ahead and do a screen share. And um, so what we'll do here is we're gonna go through and look at each of these recommendations. Um, we wanted to really like drill down and, and talk about each of these recommendations in particular, um, because we do wanna get feedback on them and see how they might be improved, specified, expanded upon, um, or maybe changed, or like if some people feel like I'm in disagreement with this recommendation and want it to be omitted, um, you know, that's, that's something that we can record here. Um, as you see, there's, you know, a, a large list of recommendations. I don't know if we'll be able to get through all of these today, um, but we can start at the top. And again, those draft recommendations are linked here. So if you click on that, you'll see that, um, that PDF. Um, but we're gonna go ahead and just start with the first recommendation. Um, and this first one is related to imperfect data. And so there's been a lot of conversations about, you know, at what point can you start using data? You know, when it's been Q, like QA, QC'd, or, you know, can it be used prior to? So, you know, vetting and cleaning data often leads to a delay in its utility. Um, but we all know that environmental justice concerns in most communities have to be dealt with now. They have to be dealt with urgently. Um, and so some, you know, some kind of thoughts going into this are data quality indicators. Um, so like accuracy, completeness, consistency, the validity of the data and reliability. Um, you know, those are all things that obviously need to be considered in decision-making. Um, you know, you want to use the best you know, possible data that, that you can find, but sometimes that data um, is not quite there yet. So there is this like recommendation to use some sort of tiered approach. Um, 
you know, data that has not been quality assured or quality checked um, can be used for screening purposes. Even if it's not perfect, this data can help start uh, directing agency resources. Data considered um, screening data should be clearly communicated as such. Um, so, you know, that mentioning that the data does not measure exposure or risk um, and mentioning that screening data um, sets to serve um, to trigger further review or more robust monitoring. So this is, these are kind of like recommendations that have been made around this like imperfect data idea. Um, and we wanna hear from the task force members as well as, you know, because we are small group members of the public, is this where we want this recommendation to land? Do we want it to be more specific in this? Um, and let's just take a few minutes to, to discuss this. So the floor is open and folks can just come off mute or, or type directly into uh, the Jamboard. Um, so you can, you can see here, um, if you click into one of these text boxes, if you prefer to participate this way, um, you can go ahead and insert your opinions um, if, if you don't want to talk. Any thoughts around imperfect data? And I can give folks a few minutes to kind of reread this slide. So this is Melissa. I do have a question. Um, so there are some um, resources out there. So, you know, we talked about uh, TRI. There's tier two reporting. Um, there are there's data, um, chemical use data, um, and emissions data in. Um, air permitting, which is a part of public record. So even if you're not necessarily getting real time data or you know the most current data that's right you know up to the second or up to the minute, um, in a lot of cases, operations don't necessarily shift uh, significantly. So if you're talking about something along the lines of uh, maybe uh, an uh, oil refining plant, or a facility that does uh, coatings uh, and uses solvents, you know, their operations aren't going to significantly shift um, from year to year because um, they're to, to change in a lot of cases, something that, um, you know, to change a process or to use a different chemical, it may have to go through a quality uh, check and an, a lot of analysis. Um, so in a lot of cases, even though that data is old, it's still going to be fairly reliable. I mean, you're still going to have an idea of how much of any particular chemical can be used over a range of time, uh, like a rolling annual average in the case of an air permit or annually in the base, you know, in the case of a tier I or tier two. Um, and you also have um, the local emergency planning commission or uh, council um, in a lot of municipalities. And in that case, there, there's a report that's required to be submitted to them so that in the event of an emergency, the fire department um, or emergency responders can show up and provide support. So that's one more area where you can pull that data. Um, and like I said, even if it is old and it was filed last year, um, for the most cases, you know, you're, and in most cases, you're probably not gonna see a tremendous shift. So you should be able to use a lot of that fairly reliably. So have we considered uh, going back through any of that historical data and, and using that as a baseline or using that as a, you know, to summarize or, or to kind of start the process? Yeah, thanks for those suggestions, Melissa. And just to be clear, you know, we are providing recommendations on, on how the data can be used. And I think um, providing data sources um, is, is key in, in developing these recommendations. Um, and, you know, to your latter question, like, you know, have we, have we used the data, um, you know, just to be clear about the role of this task force, you know, these are recommendations about whether or not certain types of data should be used and how they should be used. And the kind of implementation aspect of this is gonna come in kind of like phase two of, of this plan that's submitted in November, we need to think about kind of the implementation process. So I think those suggestions should be written into the, these recommendations um, and then hopefully like 
there would be action um, based off of off of the recommendations. Um, so I hope that provides some clarity. It does. Thank you. I, I have a question, Luna. Um, when we're looking at data too, even if it's imperfect, sometimes I feel like we don't think of looking at trends, for example, of um, homeowners that have access to insurance, where and how people live, how old homes are, um, what is the medium um, income in these communities? Like, I know sometimes we think the data is out there, but we don't necessarily connect it to like environmental and, and pollution. And do does that community have you know access to healthcare? What is the closest you know grocery store with healthy fresh food? And so when we're looking through the lens of environmental justice, do we? Are we thinking of the intersectionality of some of this data um, as, as part of like decision making um, for adding pollution to certain communities or, or more burdens, environmental burdens to communities that have other type of burdens that again, we don't traditionally or historically see as environmental or related to an air quality permit, but is absolutely um, a bigger part of that equation. And how are we making sure that that data is also speaking to, you know, the broader landscape of the reality of the communities? Yeah, and I, I think that's, you know, that's exactly what we've been talking about in the the environmental equity and cumulative impacts analysis subcommittee, right, is like making sure that th this is cross-sectional. Um, so, you know, yes, I think to to answer your question, we absolutely want, we want, well, again, I it, it's hard for me to, the recommendations need to be coming from the task force members. Um, so I almost like imagine that you're providing a recommendation that they do, you know, intersect with impacts or like cumulative impacts that are not just traditionally considered environmental or you know, physical health, but you know, talking about everything. We've we've talked about, you know, mental health and stress and, you know, a number of, of different things. Um, Renee, you know, is always very uh, good about mentioning like um, cultural sensitivity and cultural trauma, you know, all those things um, coming together. Um, so yeah, I think that's that's spot on. I think what's key to remember remembering too, even as we start this process to Beatrice to piggyback off of Beatrice too, is data helps directly impact um, implementation because then you already know how where the communities are cumulative like a number of things that data kind of helps define. So I was wondering for the Jamboard, did you want us to put where there's data gaps that we know of things like like policy barriers, like how can we help? increase the recommendation to be more specialized with these cultural contexts on the Jamboard too? Yeah, I mean, I think I think anywhere that you feel is a good place to contribute, um, you know, this is editable. And so if there are areas really on any of these slides, obviously we're focusing on this imperfect, and what we're titling imperfect data slide right now. Um, but if there are comments about like data gaps that you want to put in here, um, you're, you're welcome to type in. Um, I'll just note that Morgan is taking notes in, in a separate notes document, which is on the uh, public drive. Um, but this is really meant for, for, you know, task force members to, you know, physically type in if, if they have any um, thoughts or comments. I also wanted to address Melissa's as well, um, her point of eventually just building a baseline off of historical data. So we do have somewhere to start because it doesn't feel like we have anywhere to start still. We're still talking about recommendations in certain aspects where I'm, my biggest concern is that the recommendations don't just eventually go on another shelf, that they're able to actually inv involve and be included in future implementation that again, it doesn't return to the status quo. So how can we ensure where the recommendation in and of itself also kind of has teeth, where it's able to, okay, this is where we started historically, but look at where we are currently in data, things like that. So it can show the contrast and comparison, because that is 
one really key to transmitting to community, the comparison analysis directly, and then also in policymaking where, again, there's data gaps in immigrant communities that might not be included normally when they're first collecting data because of barriers of language barriers or digital divide or a number of other things that are barriers in specific DIC communities. I'm just using one, but things like that. And I think it's really, really crucial to where even in data where there might have been formerly projections and bias that left out those communities where we're starting to involve that over time as well too, that that should start becoming a commonality in data as well. Yeah, th yeah, thanks for that. I think a part of the next objective that this this um, subcommittee will be addressing is performance measures. And I think that's what you're alluding to is, you know, how can we show that we actually made some changes with with the information that we have. And so I really would welcome your input once we once we start having that conversation. I think that would be great. Um, when when it goes to imperfect data, I think what I was thinking when I put my addition into this specific um, conversation was I was mostly focused on like really quantitative data when it comes to water quality measurements, when it comes to air quality measurements, or those more specific um, data that's, that, that the agencies utilize to make, that they have been using, um, utilizing to make um, these um, um, decisions, regulatory type decisions. Um, the other, the other piece that, that we're talking about obviously is a cumulative piece. So how do you bring all these together, you know, in order to to make some kind of meaningful or, or some kind of meaningful decision that that helps, you know, um, overcome the environmental injustices that you know are prevalent. And so I th I think that conversation is being had in the the cumulative impacts as well. I'm not really sure. Um, I don't know. What do you think about the two task force or members from this task force joining those calls, maybe, you know, with a specific um, topic of conversation around data and how they see this data being used. Because I feel like we're having this conversation somewhat in a in a vacuum without having a direct direct link with exactly what it is that they're thinking um, that they 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 want to uh, um, kind of look at cumulative impacts. So we're thinking about the data that they could potentially need, but we don't know what kind of recommendations they're making in terms of how cumulative impacts are going to be assessed. So I think we need, I mean, I've been on their calls, but I think we need to maybe formalize where both task force get together and have this more robust discussion around cumulative impacts. What are your thoughts on that? Well, we have our two co-chairs here in the call today. That was the reason why we invited Renee um, and uh, you know and Beatrice are both the co-chairs of the environmental equity and cumulative impacts um, analysis subcommittee, and so you know this is really like you know all the all the chairs are here and you know we're this is the ideas exchange, um, and so um, I think we can definitely like elaborate on this a little bit more during the full task force meeting. Um, you know that's that's the purpose of the meeting next Tuesday is to like really sit down and talk about areas of overlap um, and uni in, in like in the report that you saw, you know, what I was mentioning, like the different highlighted sections, we, we're, you know, physically flagging where there are intersections with other subcommittees. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's really a matter of like sitting down reading the report and then, or like reading the recommendations um, for everybody, which is, you know, I think this meeting is kind of a precursor to all of that. And so maybe this can be like the motivating factor is I, I will send out the full um, list of recommendations on Wednesday. Um, and as I mentioned in the email that I sent um, last week, if, you know, all the task force members could read through those recommendations and come to that Tuesday meeting to talk about areas of collaboration and how some of these recommendations should be combined or more specified um, to focus on implementation and action. Um, I think that that's exactly what we're trying to get at. Okay, now, now you're making it such that I have to come to Denver <laughs> next week. <laughs> well, there's an option to attend um, uh, online, you know, it is a hybrid meeting. So uh, just, just know that. So 
And, and for our task force members um, who haven't mentioned, please do let me know if you plan to attend in person um, and if you'll need accommodations by tomorrow. Okay. I should be in person. That's the one at Eagle View Rec Center, right? Yeah, yeah. Eagle Point Rec Center in Commerce City um, is where the meeting will be taking place um, all day next Tuesday. Um, and then uh, in the email I mentioned, I will um, I'll send out the, the full list of recommendations for you all to review prior to that Tuesday meeting. I'll send those out on Wednesday. Um, but if you all could just let me know if you plan to attend in person and if you do plan to attend in person um, and you need any sort of like hotel accommodations, um, that's something that you'll have to book for yourself and then um, get reimbursed. And that reimbursement form is in that email as well. Okay. So I think with regards to this slide, I, I, I see you've got like a whole set of slides that we might want to go through. Um, can we just shelve it to when we sit down in person and um, have like that free exchange of ideas, you know, um, because again, it goes to that cumulative impact, you know, how do, how do you address um, when you have these um, social inequities that you know for certain, like she was like, um, I think it was Brene was talking about, you know, in terms of housing stock and things like that. And then you combine it with data that's not very um, robust in the sense that it hasn't been data qualified. So how do you decide what you can use that res those results for? You know, that mm -hmm. combination, what can you use it for? So I think that's that that would be my my question that we need to like flesh out a little bit more. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm happy to kind of, if, if you want to, the other thing I, I might suggest is that um, our task force members could maybe like manually go through these slides on their own. Um, you all have edit access to these slides. And so um, if, if you want to kind of type in um, and, and provide feedback on, you know, any of these, the only reason I'm kind of like hesitant to just not do this activity at all prior to the Tuesday meeting is because the input that we receive from you all will continue to help shape the recommendations and what we bring um, to the Tuesday meeting and, and what I end up sending out on Wednesday. Um, and I, I know it's kind of like a broken record, but these recommendations do need to come from the task force members. Um, they're not coming from the EJ program staff. So I can't really like formulate the recommendations. What we do do is like we, we listen during these meetings, we take notes. Um, and, you know, I think one of the major things that we're trying to do is move from like the questions phase to like writing recommendations that are really specific and that we can, you know, start to refine down. Um, so, you know, uni, if what you're suggesting is maybe we, we like adjourn early and have some more time to no, think. No, um, no, no, that's not what I was saying. I was saying, can we move on to the next question? Oh, okay, yeah. You know, this one needs to be addressed um, when we're sitting, um, like Beatrice, I mean, the folks from the, the different um, committees, when we're sitting down, we can really, because I did put some input into it already, but you know, yeah. it, it, what, what we've discussed today has flagged some more thought that I need to to consider. So I will go and you know incorporate that in there. But it's in the interest of time because we have about half an hour left. And and all I was saying is we have a bunch of slides. Can we just kind of move on to the next one? If that's okay. Is that okay with you, Beatrice? You just kind of get a better understanding. Okay, great. All right. Thanks. Great. Yeah. And as we um, go through these and folks have um, thoughts or ideas around a previous or like an upcoming slide. Um, feel free to kind of navigate through this PowerPoint, however you see fit. Um, so uh, yeah, I will move on to this next one. Um, this one is touching on cost, costs and benefits. Um, so the recommendation here is that agency decisions should include the full suite of economic decisions, um, the benefits of job creation, but also, for example, profit losses associated with health impacts. Um, this is actually coming out of recommendations from both this data subcommittee and the um, environmental equity and cumulative impacts um, subcommittee. Um, the other related uh, recommendation is that agencies should use economics in their environmental and health um, assessments when making decisions. 
and also consider the negative economic impacts of environmental injustice, such as the social cost of carbon. Um, so welcome any thoughts there. Yeah, so like, for example, the first thing that comes to mind is also like the opportunity for like economic development around other industries. I think that's really important. Sometimes I feel like a lot of these communities get stuck in this single industry because they're not appealing for other industries or other uses because it's heavily industrial or it's oil and gas. And it's like, how do I think there's a huge cost benefit of like um, looking to other economic forms that sometimes we don't take into consideration. Um, or for example, parks and um, protecting nature has like huge heart, uh, cost um, opportunities as well. And I feel like, again, a lot of times when one industry or we're seeing communities through one simple like lens, we're not like taking into consideration where are the um, losses um, by focusing so much on these single industries and not allowing communities to envision themselves as these alter alternate multiple opportunities when um, certain areas are so degraded or um, there's such heavy industry that we don't see, again, opportunities for other economic opportunities. And then I think back to what Katie was mentioning earlier is where are, in the long term, where are the cumulative benefits and, and where's the wealth going? Um, and some of these communities end up with the burden of cleanup or um, suffering, you know, for long term for a couple of jobs or like heavy jobs at the beginning when when things are developed and built. And then after the fact, once those industries continue to operate, um, the, the jobs start to be minimized and then all the wealth stays in other places or goes to other, it, it extracts from that community. Um, so I think that like long-term projection too of where the wealth is, is going and if it's staying in the community, um, I think that's really important. No, I think, I think, I think that's, that's a, a good, a good way to frame it. Um, some of these recommendations that we're making, you know, while they could go to, you know, the agencies as they're trying to um, incorporate environmental justice into their, their biggest strategies, I think a lot of these recommendations, some of them um, were, were somehow directing them to industry. Um, and I'm not sure how we can capture that here you know of course i'm busy taking my notes and taking it back you know because that's kind of what i do but um, i don't know you know because this goes to the conversation we had last week about you know industries recognizing there is a benefit to um to 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 being involved in these conversations and being a part of you know reducing environmental injustices but i'm not sure how you know, besides my own, you know, selfish, you know, industry perspective here of trying to see how industry can be of service here, but um, I'm not sure how we can incorporate that some of some of these thoughts into a recommendation for the for this for the state to implement. I don't know if that makes sense. I mean, it's like okay, so I think let me just let me just kind of build that on to it. So part of what I'm hearing is communities are looking for more sustainable jobs, obviously. Um, industry brings short term, you know, jobs, you know, like economic the, during the boon and bust cycle, and um, is putting the, the, the communities in a, in a better position where um, there's, there's further consideration about sustainable jobs. So I'm not sure how the agency can wrap that into, into their you know, conversation um, as as a requirement to to make sure industry brings more sustainable jobs. I'm not talking about industry, just oil and gas. I'm just talking industry broadly. Okay, um, even if it's a solar, um, a renewable facility, you know, they'll come in and do what they need to do, and 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 there will be a few jobs left over. So I'm just saying, how can we capture that as a as a recommendation to the state to consider? Um, just the sustainability of jobs. 
So I guess my point is that that's a conversation you need, we need to have with industry di directly, you know, um, on behalf of environmental justice communities that were more interested in sustainable jobs. I don't know how else to capture that. I'm big on education and making sure that we're opening these sectors to DIC and that they're not just extractive uh, sectors, but those that are sustainable, those that are renewable, those that are restorative. Um, a lot of communities, especially in Commerce City, the school districts themselves are being redistricted. There are absolutely no trade schools in solar or other spaces, super capacitors, wind, any anything that they, they're legitimately going to need to also tackle and know about and EV vehicles, what have you, and how that can help revolutionize their spaces. They're having to deal with healthcare costs, transportation costs, and these are just around youth having to help their parents. These are what I hear back from my, my students, especially in programs. And it's being mindful that now they're going to be possibly redistricted to other spaces in Broomfield. They still have to come home and live in these spaces where there's healthcare impacts. And then they're left out of really forms of education if they even can go to those schools still because they're still having to deal with their health as well. So being really mindful about, are we accessing education to these communities? How is it transformative? How are we being mindful about any barriers that are stopping them in that space and how this all intersects back to data? Yeah, thanks for, for that, Renee. Um, that that is helpful so i have a i guess my question is for the state or, or you know um i do know at the federal level they have the justice 40 program where the federal government is um, allocating 40 percent of the resources that they have towards um, environmental justice um, communities or communities that have economic justice or climate justice issues does the state have something similar because i think that's where um, some of these recommendations could go to ensure that that the funding is going to the communities that have the greatest need, whether it's towards education or um, economic development or some of these topics that we're discussing. Sorry, you got so, it, oh. I was going to add um, another example, Udi, that I'm thinking of uh, about is. Um, like the Shiroki, is that one in Pueblo, the, the Excel power plant in Pueblo, where they, they get the majority of the pollution from coal, yet, for example, Pueblo pays the most expensive electricity in the state. So even though that community is receiving the brunt of the pollution, the benefit, the economic benefit is going somewhere else to the point that the fact that they are receiving so much pollution doesn't even help them with their energy cost, right? There's no offset there. And it's like, like, that's a very unfair example of how, you know, as agencies, there should be like some sort of check and balance that, okay, this community is, is going to receive, you know, X amount of pollution. Let's, add a benefit to that community beyond just you know three or four jobs um to actually be okay it's it's much more than that right it's it's free and reduced energy or or something like that i think that should be a critical component as as we think about if if there are going to be unintended consequences of pollution, um, but the community is aware of it. And then there's the benefits and the community agree to the benefits as well that, you know. Yeah, um, thanks for that that example. Um, and you need just to go back to your question as well um, about kind of comparing the Justice 40 program uh, at the federal level with what we might have at the state level. Um, so a few different things, you know, you know that we are developing the um, EnviroScreen tool, um, which you know, is a mapping tool that can help us identify disproportionately impacted communities. Um, this intersects with the work of the, the definition of disproportionately impacted community subcommittee, which Joel is um, facilitating um, and the, the chair of that is um, Ian. Um, and so, you know, while that subcommittee and this task force um, at large is figuring out really what that definition will be. Um, that tool, that EnviroScreen tool, which is using, you know, multiple data sources, will provide kind of a visual representation of where those DI communities are 
and then we can think about the distribution of resources. Um, there are, you know, a couple different avenues. Um, we've talked about supplemental environmental projects um, at our last meeting, um, which we'll, we'll continue to talk about, but also the grants program that we're launching um, through the um, EJ advisory board, the other board. Um, and so, you know, that funding is coming from the community impact cash fund, um, which is, you know, air pollution um, penalty revenue. Um, and, you know, figuring out, identifying, you know, who are the disproportionately impacted communities and, you know, helping develop projects through those grants programs. Um, and so just wanted to mention those as like, yes, there, you know, there are avenues um, for, for that state funding to get out. I'll, I'll add on to that, Luna, which I think is a really great point. Um, you know, there, there isn't in a, say 40% investment in, in DI communities requirement at the state level. Um, certainly that is something you all as task force members could recommend. And I mean, it, to me, that's sort of an obvious fit if that's something you're interested in um, for this subcommittee, that's about how we can use data to address health disparities, right? That's kind of one of the most powerful ways that we can tie the data we have about which communities are most impacted to ways that will reduce um, the environmental health disparities that exist um, in our communities of color and low-income communities and is by ensuring that um, sufficient funding is, is, is directed there. So not don't want to overstep our role as staff, obviously, in, in terms of kind of just letting you have your ideas, but um, that is certainly something that could be a, a recommendation from the task force if you want it to be. In terms of data, can we recommend, you know, 40% of um, research and data and, and collecting that we're doing in the state go to these communities, Joel, so we can bridge some of these gaps um, and making sure that the, the investments are, are directed towards um, avoiding envi more environmental injustice and mitigating environmental injustice in the state of Colorado? <laughs> yes, I mean, you, you all can make whatever recommendations you think um, are appropriate in terms of both data gaps and then and more broadly how to address environmental health disparities in Colorado right like that's a pretty broad topic um so yeah and I, I would just say probably the more specificity there is about like what that means or which agencies are directing funding and is this the legislator legislature directing funding like I think the more details there are there the more powerful it would be as, as well as kind of making sure it's tied to a specific definition of which communities but um but yeah I mean your 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 charge is, is certainly that broad so yeah, and I will, you know, just kind of emphasize that for like, you know, all of our task force members, you know, really the recommendations you, as you're making recommendations, you don't need to necessarily have quorum, like initially, like you can, if once you read through the report, you'll see that sometimes um, there are kind of different options that come from different task force members. And at some point we will want to like vote on those or maybe reach consensus. Or maybe not, you know, at the very beginning, we talked about like a majority versus a minority report. So there's, you know, all the ideas under the sun are welcome. Um, so, you know, if you have a, a broad idea or a more specific idea on like, this is what I think should happen, um, please bring it forth. Um, okay, I'm going to have us move on to um, the next one. And, and if, again, if folks have kind of lingering thoughts, please feel free to go ahead and, and um, you know, click in, click in these boxes and um, edit, uh, make your additions on your own. Um, but I'll move on to um, data modernization. Um, so the recommendation here is that the legislature should increase funding for data modernization. Um, this has already been done for the APCD, but, you know, we're contemplating here you know, should this also be expanded to other CDPHE divisions like the Water Quality Control Division and Hazardous, hazardous Materials and Waste Management Division? Um, so, you know, this is a little bit of a question here, but, you know, the thought is that maybe the task force would provide a recommendation here about whether data modernization should apply to all of the different divisions within um, CDPHE um, and possibly beyond. Um, and um, if these data sets are able to be linked, um, then agencies and the public can further understand intersections and cumulative impacts. Not quite a recommendation here, but um, more so of a, a point being made. 
so um you know are, are folks in agreement with this um is there you know any objections here and um if they are in agree if you all are in agreement um is there anything that you want to expand upon or detail Do we want to get into like what we're collecting data on too? I feel like a lot of times, um, you know, we get like hinged on like two or three chemicals or forms of, of what we might think is harmful, but we're not collecting like across the board. And like as technology improves and as we produce things that are more complex as, as, as humans, then we, we, we don't tend to be catching up with like all the type of, um, I, I, I don't even know if I want to call them pollutants, but like all the chemicals <laughs> that we're putting into water and air. And, um, and then the thing that I'm also seeing that like is always, always lacking is what happens when you combine all of these versus separating them um, individually as well. I don't know if I'm putting, making my point across really well. <laughs> Sorry, I'm <laughs> slow. It's Monday. <laughs> talking about, again, the cumulative risk assessment piece, not the cumulative impact, but the cumulative risk, which is a little bit different from the cumulative impact, because these specific divisions like the water quality control and the, oops, and the air are really focused on like quality, quantitative data. And that's what they collect. And so we could comment on like specific, maybe parameters that, that are typically not a part of what they collect and we can make recommendation that they collect it. Like, like for example, if they're collecting just total VOCs versus breaking it down to individual VOCs that might be of interest, or if a fence line monitoring program is just focused on benzene, then we may ask for them to broaden that a little bit more to include other chemicals. So that's one piece. But then the other piece is what I'm hearing you say is, you know, something that I guess the EPA is struggling with under their task of program is how do you then take that information that you have on benzene and put it within context of everything else that's being emitted by a specific facility and how that combined um, how, how when you combine those chemical stresses, um, what is what is the potential um, health outcome? Again, but it's focused very specifically on chemicals because then you start going into another cumulative piece. So then how do you take that information and combine it with um, the housing stock or the other health inequities or the other social um, indicators? So I think for these departments, their role could be more specific directed at the data and to consider maybe the, the implications, accumulative implications of the data that they collect. Like what can you gather from, from the water data that you're collecting beyond just individual chemicals? But I don't know if they have the authority to, to do that kind of um, um, assessment. Thank you, Uni. You, you said it wonderfully. You, you have the better words than me to describe this. But then the other thing that I was thinking too is like, as temperatures are rising, right? And like, for example, we think of a body, body of water, then you add the pollutants and then, you know, different types of algae because of the temperature isn't the same anymore, right? So that's producing like new ways of creating harm to our environment and to communities. And then um, a lot of times I, I feel like we measure like air pollution when it's in the air, but then we never take into consideration that eventually it's gonna get into water streams, it's gonna get into different places as well. And then what does that mean, right? So I feel like we don't follow the chemicals like throughout the longevity of their lives and where they end up and, and what is the cumulative impacts of, of that as well. Yeah, that, that's, that's, a, that's a huge order. I mean, we, we can capture it and, you know, the state can try and figure out how, how to do with that order, but I'm not sure. I mean, I think that's a question for the state, you know, what, what within these different um, regulations that they have, what can and they can't they do like, and I know we can recommend and see if it's something they can look at, 
But, you know, in some cases, like I said, the science might not be there, but um, I guess that shouldn't stop us from making a recommendation. And I think maybe it would fall under like, um, like some future research recommendations. You know, these are areas of where um, we need to think in terms of developing the science around these issues. And so when it comes to them allocating um, research funds, and these are some of the topics that would, would come at prioritized to the top, especially if it's areas where we don't have, like the, the science is not there yet, so. So yeah. uh, this is Melissa. Um, so in a lot of cases, as someone who actually does environmental reporting and collects that data um, for, uh, for industry, um, a lot of that data is actually out there. Uh, it just has to be interpreted. Um, so just for an example, uh, something like benzene would be a hazardous air pollutant, right? So you're going to track the emissions for that based on you know, certain like mass balance calculations. Um, you're also going to do, if you have stormwater or a wastewater treatment plan, um, you're also going to be reporting that to a certain degree if you've had spills or if your samples test positive for those chemicals. Um, so it, it may not necessarily be cumulative, but with a decent mapping tool, you could pull that data together. And some of that already exists. Um, Arc just has some of those modeling layers um, that you can use for developing um, these maps and seeing where your accumulations are. Um, so that data is out there. Um, it just, it's gonna take, I think, a little more effort to make it mesh and, and to make it uh, kind of feed into a tool where you can really see a, a visual representation um, of a lot of those chemicals and what, what their, um, what their pers uh, persistence is and how they break down. Um, uh, I know that I practiced some of that modeling when I was in grad school. Um, there is software out there that can do it. Um, so you have visual representation and numerical representation. So um, I'm happy to help provide any more information on that, but any, if anybody has any questions. Yeah, thanks, thanks a lot, Melissa. I think the challenge that a lot of us are struggling with is then how do you incorporate like that, that kind of data that's more visual into some kind of policy decision? I think that's, that's a big challenge. But that's, that's extremely helpful. I just wanted to um, just back up just a little bit and just mention that um, the data modernization conversation that we were having, um, this did, a, a lot of this did come out of our conversation that we had with Michael Ogletree at the last meeting um, where he did talk about what EPCD is doing in terms of data modernization and ensuring that all of the data sets that they have are kind of um, communicating with each other and that they, they're able to like look at them all together and use them. Um, so I, I, you know, that's helpful to hear this conversation because I feel like this conversation ended up leading to the next side, slide, which is on data collection. Um, and so I just wanted to kind of draw that distinction about like the data monetization that Michael, um, Michael Ogletree, the division director of the air pollution control division was talking about, um, you know, it's kind of related to this next one as well about like, you know, where possible data should be collected using a universal format um, so that data from different sources can be easily aggregated. Um, and then I feel like we were starting to get into a conversation about like what kind of data should be collected, um, which is a slightly different, um, different topic. And I'll just read these out um, to see if there's kind of further thoughts there, but um, recommendations here that um, environmental and health divisions within CDPHE should continue to enhance communication with one another on data collection methods um, related to both environment and health. Um, Colorado EnviroScreen should be used to make decisions about where the federal and state government prioritize and allocate grant funding. And then agencies um, should focus on rural populations, which have some of the highest Colorado EnviroScreen scores. Um, and so, you know, welcome your, your thoughts um, or further elaborations on this, but this is, these are kind of recommendations that um, we put together based off of what we were hearing on uh, previous task force meetings. And I feel like we have touched on this, so I, I can move on um, to the next slide too, if, 
if we feel like we've discussed this. We are, of course, trying to capture your ideas as we hear them, but if I didn't get that right from, from Beatriz, what you said on, on that first orange bubble or, or uni, what you said on the second orange bubble or, or anywhere else in this, you know, we're, we're trying to take notes, but this is a jam board, so you all can edit it and, or just put your own ideas without us typing them, so please feel free to, to do so. Um, do we have any, does the environmental justice um, or, or CHPHE have any um, authority over like land use and like future land use um, or only like operating permits? Um, the, the, the short answer is no. Um, so, so Colorado, uh, the way our, actually our, our constitution is set up is that local governments really have almost complete authority over land use. Um, in with you know some limited exceptions and in a few sort of counter examples but but for the most part land use is entirely a local government rather than a state government decision um cdpg does have what we call our built environment program um which is designed to encourage um healthy equitable growth right so what, what sometimes i think is called smart growth policies or um, policies that sort of are more climate friendly and, and also ultimately better for our health in terms of encouraging multimodal transit that, that provides things like exercise benefits in addition to air pollution benefits. They operate more as like a grant making and sort of policy advice program though. They, they don't sort of get to tell local governments yes or no, you, you have to do certain land uses. It's more incentivizing um, local government policies. So does that answer the question? Yeah, no, I'm just thinking about like the rural communities um, aspect of that, that we just read on the previous sheet and just being how we're going to partner, educate, participate, you know, put guardrails, environmental justice guardrails around um, land use and permitting in, in rural communities and what the, um, to what extent can we protect those communities as well, especially when we see that um, disproportionately impacted communities are very rural. We don't see a lot of those representations and decision-making bodies and their local governments um, of, of especially the minority groups in those, in those, um, in those counties and those rural counties where um, we can see, you know, who's making the decisions. And a lot of times it doesn't come from the community. So I'm wondering if there's you know, guardrails that we can put in place to make sure that we are protecting those communities. Um, yeah, thanks, Beatriz. Um, and I think that's something that we can continue to elaborate on um, as we are moving from kind of the reoccurring questions. There is a separate document that we still have that's like called like kind of outstanding and reoccurring questions um, that we'll probably want to discuss in more detail. And we should, um, I would love to add that question to kind of our more robust discussion um, with our full task force, especially with like folks like Tyson who come from a rural community and um, might have some ideas there. Yeah, because I'm representing CD3 and then I, I work a lot with rural communities and I see that yeah. a lot of times the local governments don't really represent the diversity of the community and communities have very little power um, and there's less diverse representation than what we see, for example, in urban areas and less infrastructure in terms of having closer access to the agencies or having like a more robust um, nonprofit, like civic and education investments um, in those communities. So they are left a lot more vulnerable um, to environmental degradation. And I think that's why we see this, Joel, that disproportionately impacted communities are in rural communities because it's, it's, it's for a reason, it's, it's by design. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, we might want to formulate kind of a specific recommendation around this idea. And there was this last slide here um, of like any any other recommendations that I, I kind of, I feel like this one um, might be kind of more of a standalone um, type of thing. So 
Um, thanks for adding that, Joel, the, as its own rec. Um, okay, so um, we've gotten through uh, a few of these. We ended on data collection. Um, there's a number of other recommendations on kind of exactly how we want to engage um, community with data. Um, we are almost at time. Um, so one thing I will just say for our task force members um, between really now and Wednesday, because Wednesday is when I will be kind of finalizing draft one that will be sent out to the full task force and then we'll be discussing that on Tuesday. Um, I encourage you all just to, to read through these recommendations in more detail. Uni, thanks for already providing your feedback. Um, some of your feedback is already incorporated. Um, all of the feedback you provided is already incorporated into this kind of updated version that we have in front of you here. Um, but as you've kind of, you know, participated in this and, and kind of thought through and, and heard different ideas, if it sparks something else, or, you know, you want to add a little bit of specificity to these recommendations, um, I encourage you to do so. Um, so, you know, if, if folks want to continue using this Jamboard and just kind of quickly reading through, we've We've broken it down slide by slide so it's a little bit more digestible and not just, you know, like, you know, black text on a white sheet of paper. So hopefully it'll feel a little bit more interactive, but we welcome um, your feedback between now and Wednesday and I'll be sure to incorporate it um, into the draft that goes out. Um, I know that that was a little bit of rush. Um, and so Again, if you all have um, ideas on how you want to, as this like recommendation list continues to expand and get larger, um, if you all have ideas on how you want to continue having these conversations, you know, if this felt productive and it, like a good way to do it, um, I think we can stick to that. But if there are, you know, other ways that you all want to process um, and kind of have these discussions together, please do bring forth those ideas as well. Um, but yeah, so thank you all so much. Um, we do have a, uh, another subcommittee meeting coming up tomorrow on the definition of disproportionately impacted communities. Um, that's gonna be taking place tomorrow evening um, with uh, Ian and Joel, Joel um, taking the lead on facilitating that. Um, that's from uh, three to 6 p.m. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, um, I will send out the full list of recommendations. I keep saying Wednesday, I'll send it out on Thursday, um, June 16th. And then we'll have our full meeting on um, on Tuesday, the 21st. Um, again, uh, Renee, I, I know you verbally said that you will be attending in person. So I have your RSVP down um, for um, Beth Basin Uni. Um, give it a thought and uh, just let me know if you plan to attend in person. Thanks I'll all be, so much. I'll, I'll be there. I'm looking for a ticket right now, so. <laughs> okay. All right, it will be nice to meet everybody and see you next week. Yes, see you all next week. Thanks again, Katie, for your presentation. Bye all. Bye. Thank you.